we're going to talk about personal safety on the road. Uh, a lot of this stuff comes from boot camp. We teach it in boot camp. We also teach it in the RVOU, which is our online education program also. But a lot of times we go to RV parks. Where do you park at? Where do you want to go? And what we do is we use what, uh, an app called All Stays. And it lets you know where the camp, it doesn't have all the campgrounds in here, but it lists a lot of the campgrounds. And uh, it also will let you know what kind of amenities they have there also. But we use it because one, it tells us where the Walmarts are, where fuel stations are, dump stations, rest areas. But most of all, it gives us an insight into reviews for the campgrounds. But you have to realize when we're talking about campgrounds, if I may look at some amenities that you don't need, because I carry my wireless internet with me, my MiFi with me all the time, where you may have to have Wi-Fi. Uh, one time we were going to Florida for a rally, and we were looking for an RV park down there for a few days ahead of time, so we go down and scope stuff out, and went into the RV park reviews, looked at the reviews, and it says, if you really like airplanes, this is the place you need to be, because it was on the flight path to the Jacksonville airport. And so we stayed someplace else. It was a little bit quieter too, and it was fun. So we do that. Okay, uh, on your stick and brick house, we have motion lights. You have motion lights on your houses. Mm -hmm. Well, for RVs, you can get motion lights also. Uh, they Several different makers make them. You have a uh, Starlight 1000 RV light that has them. Uh, again, if you go out to Quartzsite, Tampa RV Show, any of the rally, the bigger rallies, the bigger, RV shows, they will have stuff that you can buy. And we have one on ours, they come in white or black, uh, either clear lens or yellow lens, but they're motion activated, which are great to have because, you know, we go out and have fun. And if you go out at night and you don't turn on your light and you come home after dark, instead of fumbling around, it would be nice to have some light. So that's one good thing about having motion lights out there. Uh, some people use the uh, little uh, lights that sit down on the ground that can go in there that are uh, solar powered, which are great also. But again, it's, I, I like my motion light too. You have to be careful with the motion light because if you're going down the road at night, as you're going down the road, the light will go on and off and it may blind other people in the other lanes. So just turn that switch off before you're uh, going down the road is a little, a little hint for that part. Mainly because we've had a trucker tell us that at the rest area. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. It's like one of those things. You never think of it because you're driving and who cares about what's on to you on the right side of you. It doesn't make any difference. Another area that's big concern is that CH751 key. Majority of your RVs come out of the factory with the 751 key. The problem with other RVs, but, you know, a lot of RVers, they will not bother your stuff because they understand that they don't want your stuff because they have too much of their own stuff <laughs> but the 751 key is also common to file cabinets toolboxes and other locks so somebody that is not an RVer could come through the RV park wherever you're staying and open up the compartments and get your stuff out of the locked compartments, even though it's a 751 key, that is very common. So we suggest that you change your locks out. That way you don't have to worry about your stuff being missing. And it's relatively easy, you can do it yourself. And there's a, a company that will help you do that. It's a www.751, excuse me, www.ch751.com is what that is and they will walk you through so that you can replace your 751 key and it's a strong suggestion that you do that uh, I've done that for all of my RVs we're getting ready to get our eighth RV now because you never you know you always want to buy your third RV first but I'm learning that you really need to buy your eighth or ninth RV first because <laughs> uh, we're fix fixing to get another RV here in just a couple of weeks looks like another thing that I ran into whenever being a police officer on the street and that's the hide a cans. Where do you hide your stuff in your RV? Where do you hide your stuff in your house? Because a lot of times if you get broke in, the burglar who comes through commonly knows where they're going to look at. 
and that could be a problem. And I'm going to tell you where I hide my stuff at. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. It's the, it's, it's the hide accounts. And you can get them off that new website that you can get almost anything from is Amazon, <laughs> or you can get them from the container store, but they're hide accounts. They come in different types of cans Dr. Pepper, AW Root Beer, 7 Up, Barbasol shaving creams, Ajax cans, stuff that you commonly have in your RV or your house. And these are great because the bottom will unscrew and you can stick your valuables in there. Now you can't stick a lot of valuables in there, but you can get a lot of your jewelry, small jewelry and your money in there. And you just put it back on the shelf. Not everybody's going to be going through all your canned goods to find your stuff. So they're very, it's very good to have. Uh, another thing you can do is they make some t-shirts or coats with sewn in pockets already that you can put your bigger items in. Or, you know, some RVs now are coming with safes. When we had our fifth wheel, I saw our, our safe twice, two times I saw our safe. Once when we got it, and then once when we sold it. Because in between that time, I could never find it because of the 36 pairs of shoes over the <laughs> safe, which well, is a true story. Shoe collection. No, it's not my shoes. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, another thing, people will also buy a portable little fire safe, which are great. But you don't want to do what my, my, my buddy did. He decided he was going to permanently mount his safe, his little, you know, fire safe underneath his, his storage bin of his bed. And so he opened up the, the, the bed, lifted the bed up, drilled the holes in there, and bolted it down to the floor. And he called me over. Hey, Jim, look what I did. I got my safe installed. Okay, great. Okay, Bruce, I got a question for you. How are you going to pull your slide in? Because what he did was he drilled through the floor of the, of the bed, through the floor of the RV while the slide was out, and he permanently bolted everything together. So there's no way to get the slide back in. Oh, no. So you have to be careful and have to plan this stuff out. Uh, but it's a great idea to have bolt down little safes. Uh, they're called apartment safes. A lot of college students use these safes in the dorms, which are great to have. And Again, you know, you can keep a lot of a lot of things in that safe. You really can't afford to put in a gun safe, so to speak, mainly because it adds a lot of weight. And of course, we want to be able to carry more stuff with us than than a uh, than all our guns in a gun safe. I have a question about safes, though. Okay. So you're talking about your friend that that bolted his to the bottom of his RV um, or the floor of the RV. That in theory, that does sound really good, aside from the slide issue, of course. Exactly. Um, but also, if it's something like what, what do you think about safes that you need to be able to take with you? Let's say there actually is a fire emergency in the RV and he wants to take his fireproof safe out with all of his valuables in it and mm -hmm. it's bolted. Like, what do you think about that? Is it something that you should be concerned about or because it's a fireproof safe, ideally it'll still be maybe one of the few things left in your RV when it's done? <laughs> yeah, theoretically it should be there, but the fire burns hot. Uh, the fire will double in size every 20 seconds in an RV fire. And if you think about that, if you have a 40 foot RV and it's in the back or even in the front, that's why you have to plan on how you're going to get out of your RV. And a lot of times we suggest having a go bag with some credit cards, some money, some pills in there, uh, maybe an extra cell phone, you know, that you can have by the door or somewhere that you can get out of your RV quickly. But when it comes down to a fire, getting out is essential property can be replaced. Having the fireproof safe is one thing you can do, mm -hmm. but when you're trying to get out of the fire, out of that RV, out of the fire, you're going to think of nothing but getting out of there. And once you go out of the RV, you do not want to go back in because again, the fire will double in size every 20 seconds. And it's really a time bomb when you have your tires going off, when they heat up and they explode. If you have propane, that may explode. Uh, all of your other uh, cleaning supplies underneath the kitchen, they're going to heat up and they're going to, you know, explode, expand and explode. So really it's best just to grab what you can, grab your purse, grab your, your go bag and get out of that RV. And I'm sorry, property can be replaced. We can't. So that's the strong suggestion that we say on that. And I think firemen would agree with that too. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I think a general <clears throat> rule, whether it's a house, a vehicle or whatever, is once you're out, don't go back in. So exactly. that makes sense. It, it really does. It really does. 
Okay, uh, another thing we get questions on are a cell phone booster. Do you need one? Well, cell phone boosters are great. Uh, I have one. I have one that I, I dearly love. Um, what we use is a MiFi, a you know, for our internet. And we have a cell phone booster that we use religiously because we get in some places that the signal is weak. And one thing that we do, because we do work for escapees, uh, I am in charge of RVOU, and I like to answer the questions in a timely fashion through the internet. So it's essential. And a lot of people now are working from the RV, which is great. Uh, homeschooling and going around seeing the country is, is a wonderful thing to do, but we still like our connectivity. And so a, a, a cell phone booster is great. Uh, there are several brands out there. Uh, I've got two different brands, and really I can't tell any difference between the two, but they work great. It's not going to produce a signal if there's none, none there. you got at least to get like a, like a half a bar. But once you get that half a bar, it may boost it up to three bars. If you got three bars, it may boost it up to four. It depends upon the dynamics of the atmosphere and the signal coming in and other things that are beyond my technical skills. But we do like the cell phone booster. Uh, again, it, it helps us and gives a little bit of peace of mind because, again, we like to boondock. We like to go out to Arizona desert and just go out there and, you know, get up in the morning and smell that good, clean, crisp air. And we do the same thing around Martha, Texas also, out of the Big Bend area. But again, we like our connectivity, so we use our cell phone boosters. Another big, big question that comes about are weapons in the RV. Uh, should you carry a weapon? And that's going to be your individual choice. Being a retired police officer and still being a police officer, I have the advantage of having a natural carry license, which is, which is great. That's why Lisa always says she always has her policeman with her. <laughs> but it's going to be your choice. You have to understand, if you are going to use a weapon, you know, and weapons can include, you know, we think weapon, we think of a handgun. What also constitutes a weapon is OP, OC pepper spray or tasers. You know, those are weapons also. <clears throat> Excuse me. I suggest if you're not comfortable with a weapon such as a firearm is to carry wasp spray. And you may have already heard this before. I ran into it years ago where I saw a friend of mine that was walking on one of the paths uh, there in, in San Angelo where I had my career at. And I stopped her and I said, Vicki, what are you uh, carrying a can of wasp, for, wasp spray for? She goes, Jim, you never know when you're going to run into an angry wasp. It's like, okay, now, Vicki, why are you really carrying it? She goes, hey, it shoots over 20 foot. You read it, it says, do not spray in eyes or the mouth. If somebody's attacking me, all bets are off. I don't care. It allows me to spray them and get away. And that's what I'm after. Plus, it's legal. And then she may run into an angry wasp also. So there's always that possibility. But if you are going to carry a weapon, a firearm, it's strongly suggested you go ahead and get a concealed handgun license. That way you are protected. And there are some publications out there. There are some apps out there that will let you know where you can and cannot carry a weapon because some states are more friendlier to weapons than others. So you have to be conscious of if you're going to be carrying the weapon. Uh, but again, wasp spray, best thing to do because bear spray, even though we do have bears in Texas, believe it or not, around Big Bend, there are some bears down there. Uh, but bear spray, I would rather, and we carry wasp spray because again, you never know when you're going to run into a wasp nest because you're parked for a while. Those mud daubers and wasps love to be hide their nests and they like to be a better hider than you are a seeker. And <laughs> I've been bit before and I don't like it. And that's why I carry wasp spray with me all the time. But again, it shoots over 20 foot and it's legal to carry. You don't have to worry about it. Another thing for safety on the road, we strongly, strongly suggest you carry is a weather radio that will work on batteries or electricity. The reason why you want dual is because electricity goes off. You still want to be able to have the weather radio go, go off and let you know what's going on. Uh, because flash floods, as we know around here, we've had some flash floods before that, you know, RVers have been caught up in that, which is not a good thing. So we need to be able to, uh, you know, get out of there. And again, 
property we're not going to worry about. It's our lives that we're going to do. And, you know, the National Weather Service, what do they say? Turn around, don't drown, which is very, very important. But again, you don't want to put yourself into a position that can harm yourself. So, you know, if you're going to be parking along a creek side where the fishing's great, just realize, have your weather radio going in case there is a flash flood because it could rain 20 miles away and come roaring down that river. And that's something that's going on in Phoenix right now with that last tropical storm, tropical storm mm-hmm. that came through. Is a, there was a lot of flooding out in Arizona that they typically don't get. And we've got pictures and we've seen, you know, uh, one of my other jobs was Homeland Security, and we would go out and assess damage that occurred after flash floods or tornadoes. Not a good thing, because you know bad weather and RVs don't go together. They do not. So that's some of the tips real quick. <laughs> well, something, so talking about weather radios, this is, uh, Jim's got it here in his hands, now he'll show you. This is actually a little weather radio that I keep in my office here at Escape East headquarters, but if I travel, it's handy too. You can get them as small as something the size of your palm. And then of course there are larger ones. There are hand crank ones. There are all kinds of things out there. Um, but yeah, they don't have to be huge and bulky for you to have room for one in your rig. Because I understand that sometimes it's hard to find even a little couple inches square spot that's gonna work for that, you. <laughs> that is very true, yes. Uh, I've actually had to mount my weather radio on the wall because we didn't have any cabin space, which is fine. It works. It works great. Nice. And every time it goes off, it's my turn to go turn it off. Oh, that's right, because yes. Lisa's quite a bit shorter. <laughs> I don't want to say she's shorter, but it's always my turn. Yeah, that works too. That works too. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I've got a couple questions here already, but if you guys okay. have any questions, feel free to go ahead. If you're, if you're tuning in with Zoom, you can use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen or the chat option that's to the side of that. If you're here on Facebook and joining us there, thank you for joining in, by the way. Um, You're welcome to use the comment section and I will try and snag your questions as they come in. So feel free to ask any questions you have about how personal safety and RVing can work together and how to to protect yourself and your things while you are traveling. Um, So one of the things that came up, Jim, is I know there is a big movement right now uh, that's encouraging women to go out and travel on their own, even if Um, Maybe they have a spouse that's not as interested in traveling, but they are, or if they just, if they do just want to travel alone for their own reasons, Mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, there are a lot of women who want to get out there and do it, but there's a lot of fear about, well, I don't have my, I don't have someone there with me to help protect me um, in the case that something goes wrong. And so I've heard some advice about things like, I've heard um, suggestions that women go and pick up an old worn out pair of men's work boots from the thrift store or something like that to set outside or like a men's coat of course it has to be weather appropriate type of thing but like a men's coat or something that indicates there's a male that lives there as well um so what do you think about things like that or do you have any other advice like that that you think would could be worthwhile all of that all the above but what we encourage women to do so in solo women you need to come play with us uh it's it's fun it really i encourage anybody single men single women but again for the single single people that are traveling, again, you need to be extra careful, extra vigilant. I guess I should say what that is is the word is the correct word to use. But yeah, going and get you a dog leash and tying it up to the the door handle or the handle going up to the RV. Uh, the dog bowl uh, mm-hmm. is a great thing too. To have hey, you may have a stray dog come by and, and uh, appreciate the water bowl. And I've heard the bigger the better because then they think you got a bigger bigger, bigger dog. dog in there with you. Exactly. <laughs> Just make sure your dog's not bigger than your RV. Uh, yes. Uh, the work boots are great also. What I personally like are, I told you I was going to tell you this, is the fake bullet holes that you can put <laughs> everywhere. You, know, you can put them on the front door. <laughs> as a joke, but again, that's something to think about. But again, the whole idea of, of personal safety, even crime prevention that we used to teach uh, residents of the city, is you don't put yourself in a position you're not comfortable with. You're not comfortable in an RV park. Where you're parking at, by all means, move. There's nothing wrong with that. So you lose a lose a deposit or whatever. Who cares? Your life's not worth it. Uh, always another good thing is to have your key fob with you. You know, honk the, if you hear something outside, honk the horn. Let them know that that you're there. Uh, the key fob is an excellent thing you do. Uh, a lot of people will travel in a Class C or Class B RV, drivable RV, 
that they could literally move if they needed to. You hear somebody outside, you start it up and, and you get out of there. Realizing that there's advantages and disadvantages for all types of RVs. If you have a, a truck pulling a trailer and you disconnect and you want to leave with your RV, then you have to go outside and actually hook up the RV itself. Uh, and the same thing if you have a, you know, a class C and you're pulling a car, you have to do that. So if you were going to spend a few, a few, like one night, leave your, leave your vehicles hooked up. You know, you may go out there and then come back and hook them up. That way you're ready to go. But again, in, in a, in a travel trailer or fifth wheel, you have to go outside to get your engine going, which is a bad thing to do sometimes if somebody's out there. But 911, you know, a lot of times 911 will work in places that you can't use regular cell phone service. That they that that would work also. Uh, again, the cell phone booster is another good thing too to have also. But again, knowing where you're at is a good thing too because uh, I was over communications for a while. And one of the things, you know, when we answered 911, we say, you know, 911, what's your emergency? Where are you at? And if you're operating on a cell phone, it may take a while to get to you because they're using triangulation versus a stick and brick house. Because if you call from a stick and brick house, we know exactly where you're at because the address pops up. But if you're using your cell phone, you've got to know where you're at all the time so that you can relay that to the particular uh, person that you're talking to. Another thing is there's some tracking devices that you can use. And I know some of the escapees went to Alaska last year mm -hmm. and they use there's some apps out there to let you know where they're at. And, you know, let your family, let your friends know where you're at. Uh, one thing we tell you when, if you're going to be, uh, you know, off by yourself and you start posting stuff on Facebook, be careful what you're going to put on Facebook again, because, it's, you know, especially if you have a stick and brick house and you're going to be gone for a while, it's like, Hey, come rob me. I'm not here anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but again, it's just, it go, all goes back to common sense. It's really, don't put yourself into that position. But again, the dog bowl, the big shoes, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Anything to make it look like you're going to be there. If you have a, a campsite, instead of putting out one chair, put out two chairs because that looks like you're camping with somebody. And even though you may be by yourself, somebody may come along and be walking around. You may be, make, meet a new friend. Mm -hmm something of this. So, you know, just think outside the box of what you can do to portray yourself of, of strong, confident, and not going to take it anymore. Good point. Um, so you, you brought up the idea of the, of the handguns or some type of um, firearm. Jack has a question about what do you do with your weapons when you're traveling to Canada or Mexico, basically going across border crossings? Okay, if you're gonna, that's, we, yeah, that's also a good, pro, a good problem, so to speak. If you're going to take a handgun across the borders, they're not going to let you do that uh, because they have, especially in New Mexico and, and, and Canada, especially Mexico uh, or ammunition either. What you can do is leave if you know you're going up leave them back with somebody but if you're full timing realize that you're going to have to go someplace to drop them off what you can do is rent a safety deposit box at uh close to where you're going to be going you know maybe that you bank with wells fargo there may be a wells fargo in the town a couple of miles from where you're going to cross at leave them in the, in the safety deposit box. The problem with that is you're going to have to come back to the same place to re regain your, your, uh, uh, your weapon. A lot of people tell me what they do is they go pawn them. They go to a pawn shop and they will pawn them. And as long as they pay the interest on the, you know, keep the pawn active, then they, you know, they're, they're secure. But the problem with that is, again, you have to come back through your, that port in order to pick up your guns. What I did, we went to Canada this year, is we left the weapons with a relative. And said, we told them, don't play with them. <laughs> you know, but we left them with a relative, with a friend, whatever you can do, because you do not want to take them across the board. Uh, a friend of mine, actually a retired police officer, had a Thompson submachine gun, rifles, everything, legally owned, and he was going to Alaska and he went and hit the Canadian border and he didn't make it to Alaska because they confiscated everything. 
because mm -hmm. of bringing weapons into the into Canada. This is several years ago. He didn't do his research. Uh, I told him, Richard, you need to do your research, yeah. see what you can do. But uh, if you want to go to Alaska and take your guns, then you're going to have to mail them from one uh, licensed dealer to another licensed dealer in Alaska. It's just like Lisa bought a brand new gun in Tennessee. We're Texas residents. We could buy it in Tennessee, but it had to be shipped to a gun dealer here in Livingston so that we could pick it up. We couldn't get it out of, out of uh, Tennessee. They had to come back to Texas for that. So there are solutions, but don't take it across the border. Now, I have heard, um, and I've heard this from a couple of our members who went to Alaska, I believe last summer, that you there are some minor, like I, by minor I mean very small exceptions to the no firearms rule. For example, um, like, like we were talking earlier, there is a threat of bears and other dangerous wildlife in Canada as well as Alaska. And you can take properly documented and properly, um, I'm not sure what the right word would be, but ones that are, that are meant for self-protection against wildlife, like a rifle versus a, rifle, a pistol shotgun. type of thing. Yeah, you can you take do those. have to do a lot of paperwork though. It's yeah, not, you, have, you don't just show up with it. Yeah, you have to do the paperwork to take, take, be able to take a shotgun or a rifle into Canada. Uh, Mexico, I don't even think they allow that. But if you're going to go hunting in Canada, there is a way to do that. And again, you need to do the research on that. I'm not up to on that. I know there's a way to do it. Uh, I just have no desire to yeah. <laughs> take shotguns, rifles into Canada. Yeah, and it's much easier just to just to, leave, to, you know, to leave them at home. To just answer for whatever other things you may have in your vehicle and not deal with the legalities of firearms. Yeah. Um, okay, so then thinking about bears, one of the things that I've heard before is that, um, thinking again about also border crossings, that, for example, pepper spray can't go into Canada. However, yes. bear spray can. And right. so maybe, like, would you have any any experience or any advice on having one versus the other on a regular basis or anything like that? Well, again, pepper spray is oleoresin capsaicin. It's the, it's the stuff that makes you cry, uh, <laughs> literally. Uh, as police officers, we have to, if you want to carry pepper spray, you have to get sprayed with pepper spray. Because again, you know, you could actually get sprayed by another officer. You need to know what it does to you so you can work through that. But pepper spray in some locales, even states in, in the United States, are illegal to have. But again, Walmart sells it in Texas. Sporting Goods sells it in Texas. Uh, they're great to have. There is an expiration date on it. That's the problem. Uh, again, you're going to have to check the particular state that you're going to go into whether it's legal to have or not. But again, that's why you know, bear spray is really another version of OC pepper spray is really all that is. But again, you know, pepper spray is legal where, you know, excuse me, pepper spray is legal. Bear spray <laughs> is legal. Pepper spray is not in some areas. That's why I go back to the wasp spray. Wasp spray. Okay. It's legal. Do I have to worry about it? What do you have it for? I have it for, you know, wasps because you never mm -hmm. know where they're going to show up at. So we have a question from Elaine who's joining us on Facebook. She asks, what kind of tips do you have for securing things like laptops, passports, et cetera, just while you're out for the day? If, well, a lot what we do, and I tell you what we do, for our passports, we keep them in a fire safe. That way they are secure. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you where I hide them but uh, <laughs> where we hide the fire safe, but we carry in the fire safe. If like, if we go on a cruise, we got to have our passports all the time. I just carry our passports with them. I carry a I carry a man bag. I carry a satchel and I, it's big enough. I can put my uh, iPad in and some water and some stuff to, to chew on during the day, beef jerky, whatever. Uh, and uh, the passports in it. So I always have them with me. Uh, and then Lisa has her, her bag also her girl bag, I guess. Uh, but again, in your rig itself, they do make, again, some safes that, uh, if you ever go to a motel, they're starting to put the safes in the closet somewhere in there that you can punch your code in and have, it's big enough, you can get them big enough that you can put your laptop in there. And what you're gonna do is bolt it down inside the RV someplace. And a lot of people are doing that. Uh, so again, some of your newer up-end coaches 
are coming in with a safe big enough that you could put your laptop in, that you could put important papers in, uh, rings, jewelry, whatever it is. Uh, but again, that's why, you know, for small items, I like the hide of cans. I really, really do. Uh, and I don't own stock in them, <laughs> but I, I do like them. And again, you know, the, the small safes, you can get them big enough that you could put your laptop in and such. Uh, again, you have to, that's why really on, a, on an RV, that's why I really like to have a deadbolt too. Uh, Cause I've, I've worked burglaries where they've taken a pickaxe and literally mm. peeled away the door because, you know, they're not the, they're not solid core doors like you could get in a house. Yeah. But again, there's that possibility. That's why I like the, the deadbolt. And a lot of your newer RVs aren't coming with a deadbolt. And that's why a lot of times we'll see, you know, you may have that frosted glass in the front. Well, somebody knocks on your door, you have to think, how does a door open up in a house? It opens to the inside. The RV is always open to the outside. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And so a lot of times, even in boot camp, we'll tell you to get a peephole. You can get peepholes and put in there. Um, again, you have, to, you have to figure out what size thickness of the door you have so you can get the right size people but if you have that frosted glass you can't see who's knocking on the door and you may want to peek around maybe you have a window you can look at but I like the people and the, and the thing about if you are going to install a people you got to put it to the level of the lowest person or the shortest mm -hmm. person because you know I'm six foot two Lisa's five foot two if I put it to my height she's gonna to have to get a stool in order to see out. <laughs> yeah. I can bend over. She can't grow to see out the people. So you always put it to the uh, height of the shortest person. But again, that's something, it's an aftermarket thing. And some of the newer RVs are coming out with peepholes now because yeah. of that, of that issue. Um, so another <laughs> question I was thinking about with the, you mentioned the, the CH751 key earlier and how common that is. We have a couple of people who may have joined us on Facebook um, since we started earlier. So one of the issues with the CH751 key is that it's used pretty much universally. Um, and it's, from what I recall, some of the RV door keys can be the same, not just the ones for the, ba the bays and the bins underneath, but some of the ones for the doors, like multiple of the same model. They may be shipped to different parts of the country, but they still have the same keyhole. Um, do you have any advice on some of the I've seen, like the the punch button, the digital keypads and things like that and replacing your door key as well? You can, and they do make, uh, they do, there are some companies out there that do make the uh, coded uh, door locks uh, on our uh, on our Jayco RV. We have that now and it's great as long as the batteries are good. Mm. So you have to make sure you replace the batteries in that at least every six months. A lot of times it depends on how long, you, how often you use the keypad too. But again, if it, and this happened to us when we were out in California, where the batteries went dead. We went on a cruise to Hawaii, come back, the batteries were dead. Luckily, I had the keys to the door that we could get back in and then replace the batteries. But yeah, it's an aftermarket thing. They run anywhere from $100 to 250 Not a bad thing. That way you don't have to worry about it. And even I have it where, like your key fob for your, for your uh, vehicle, they have it for the key fob for the door. It'll unlock your door too. Nice. So that you can go in, especially if it's great if it's raining. You know, if it's raining, you don't want, you want to get in as fast as you can. And that's one good thing about having the key pop. So yeah, it's amazing what aftermarket equipment is out there for RVers. Because just when you think you've seen it all, something <laughs> else is going to be made. And that's why you need to go to Quartzsite, Arizona, to the Big Tent at the end of January. Okay, they got everything. To find out what, it, what, you, <laughs> what you need. Exactly. Okay. Plus, we'll be having some fun out there too. Might as well come and join us. We have a Scapey Happy Hour. Yeah. We'll have out there. Uh, and the escapers group, our yes. working HRVers will be out there in that area. I don't know if they're going to be in Quartzsite for the show, but they'll be in Arizona. Yeah, so. I think the convergence was a couple of weeks before the show, and it'll be in Lake Havasu. Yeah. I don't know if there's any room left open or not. There's, there's might be some, but um, we are. Lisa and I will be out there at Lake Havasu. And we'll be teaching the yes. Boot Camp Express. You've heard of Holiday Inn, Holiday Inn Express. This is Boot Camp <laughs> Express, which is a shorter version of Boot Camp. It's just a one day, down and dirty. You get all the highlights of boot camp. Uh, if you can't do the entire three days, then we do the do it in one day. 
and that is selling out also. Nice. Um, so something that came to mind early last year, actually, I met with another one of our members, Mandy Lee. She's a, a well-known photographer that travels full-time in her RV. She and I were talking about personal safety for solo RVers, and one of the things that she brought up, unfortunately, it happened to her, was securing her towable RV, her trailer, because she had um, one evening had detached from her vehicle, and when she woke up that morning, the trailer itself was gone. She was, sorry, let me clarify that. She was not in the trailer when it was stolen. She was elsewhere when yeah. it was stolen. Yeah. But do you have any advice for securing your towable when you drive away from it to make sure that no one else comes along, hitches up, and takes off? Yeah, one thing as a police officer, I did take reports of fifth wheels being stolen and regular tow, tow bumper pull trailers being stolen also. Master Lock, a lot of your different lock companies make different types of locks for that, for that, for the, uh, for the ball hitch, so to speak. Uh, and they're great to have and, and really invest in a good one because this is what we tell people for crime prevention In crime prevention. You're trying to send that person who's going to rip you off to somebody else's RV. You want to send them to somebody else's house. I want them to go to your RV and rip your stuff off and leave my stuff alone. <laughs> I hate to say that, but that is the truth. Yeah. We want them to go someplace else, so it's not us. That way we can say, oh, I'm sorry it happened to you, instead of, instead of them saying that to us. But we're trying to make it so if there's two RVs sitting there, one doesn't, one's not locked up, and the other one is, which one are they going to take? They're going to take the one that's not the easiest target. Even for fifth wheels, you can get the fifth wheel pin cover that attaches to the bottom of the pin. And you can also get it with a stabilizer. It comes with a, I don't want to say a cheap, but it's an inexpensive padlock. You can break it real easy with two screwdrivers. Replace it with a better better lock. But again, if one's locked, the other one's not, which one are they going to take? And the same thing for what you're laying around, because uh, we have a portable satellite antenna. We use a master, car, master, master lock uh, cable and padlocks that we lock it up to the RV. That way it's there. So we don't lose it. Uh, if you have a uh, surge guard on the pedestal, you can secure them also. You know, again, where are they going to go to? They're going to go to the person that's the easiest target. And that's the whole idea behind crime prevention. Make yourself a hard target. So yeah, again, there's a lot of products out there that are great. Uh, invest a little bit of money because you're investing a lot of money mm -hmm. in this RV. Invest a little bit for the lock. That way it'll still be there when you get back. Because that's a sinking feeling. You go out and you're Oh, my stuck. goodness, yes. Oh, yeah. Especially when your RV is your home. And, yeah. Exactly. Most definitely. Exactly. Um, we have a comment here from one of our Zoom attendees. His name is Charles. Um, he just wants to add in that for pepper spray, it is possible to get a cons uh, CCW permit. And many times this covers pepper spray as well. And he's also um, added that a Florida permit will cover 30 plus states. Yeah. Is that accurate? Oh yeah, that, that is accurate because some, it, and that's, there's a good publication uh, that I can't remember who, who did it uh, that covers the different laws of the states, Canada and Mexico also. Are you talking about the app? Well, there's an app for okay. that, but there's also a, a booklet for it too. Okay. Uh, I have both. Uh, there's an app for that? Yeah, there's an app for that. Uh, <laughs> Mainly because, you know, the law changed, and this guy, has, he's a lawyer, and he really has kept up on the weapons. Uh, but, yeah, that's why you have to check where you're, where you're going to. I know South Dakota, Texas, has a lot of places there, reciprocal agreements, what it's called. Uh, when you're dealing with uh, uh, California, New York, Massachusetts, those are really, really restricted. And so you have to be careful going into those states. But, again you shouldn't be driving so fast that you get pulled over. True. You know, and I'm not saying what police don't know won't hurt them. But again, you know, and there are some people. Straight I, from the horse's mouth. I have, I have some, <laughs> I have some uh, friends of mine who will not go to California because they don't want to get rid of their kids, which, yeah. which is their you know, prerogative. Uh, but again, check where you want to go to see what, what is legal for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and it's even interesting. I, the first time I went into California was last year and found out that even some produce you can't take into California. That is true. Like it's, yeah. There are some 
Like yeah. my, my, my handgun and my apples are both illegal in California. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and the other thing too that a lot of people don't realize that if you're towing, the speed limit's not 70, it's 55. Yes, there are a lot of states where the towing speed limit yeah, is very different and, than the standard. Yeah, and so you have to be careful with that because that would give them an opportunity to be able to pull you over. And uh, and I was wrong on that because we actually stopped a uh, highway patrolman we, at a rest area and we pulled over. And I said, it didn't apply to our veers. And we went over and asked the, the highway patrolman. He said, yep. And Seriously. that was one of the few things when Lisa was right and I was wrong. <laughs> It's on, it's on video now. Yeah, it is. Uh -oh. and I admit it. I admit <laughs> that. Yes, I admit that. I admit that very, very readily. But yeah, I really didn't think it was. But again, I'm not a California officer. I don't know all their laws. Yeah, and one of the things I know I've seen, I definitely appreciate that working with our viewers gives me a different perspective just as a motorist myself, even mm -hmm. when I'm in my little, my little sedan running around type of thing, um, that sometimes those lower speed limits aren't necessarily meant to punish you or anything like that when you're towing, but it's, they know their roads aren't that great. Yeah, and yeah. so they That's lower true. the speed limit for people who are towing just to help you be a little bit safer too. That's true. Let me add one thing about a comment about weapons. My father, when he retired, he bought an RV and he went RVing. Uh, he had a class, so him and mother went RVing before he had his heart attack. And he carried a gun, he carried a 32 all the time. And one day he was down there visiting us in Texas and he says, here, take this. I don't need this. He says, it's just a, a, a pain, you know, concealing it or whatever. He says, because I don't need it. You know, generally, you know, it's, it's, we're, we are a safe community. What happens is when, you know, we're out boondocking and you have these rabble rousers come around. Yep. Uh, but again, he, you know, he got rid of his gun. Again, it's going to be an individual choice. Yes. Your turn. Uh so Jack has a great question here, actually. He's wanting to know, are there any states where Class A's need to stop for, at the truckway stations that you know of, I should say? Thank you. As of now, no. Mainly because, this is one thing that we do for RV advocacy. Uh, we fight for the rights of RVers. Where you see the truck scales is because it is a commercial it's a commercial application and what they're doing, they're charging the commercial truck companies to come through there, there uh, and you, know, you have to pay in order to come through and use the roads commercially. We are recreational, we are a private. And that's why a lot of times if you see these big 18 wheelers, the Volvos pulling a fifth wheel on the bottom of the door, somewhere on, that, mm -hmm. on, the, on the 18 wheeler, on the, the truck tractor, it'll say, not for hire, private, you know, private RV. That way they don't have to stop for the truck scale. So as of right now, I know of no states that require RVs to pull over. Now, where you get in trouble is if you go to Montana and get a Montana LLC, you have now registered your RV as a commercial vehicle because it is a company vehicle. Mm -hmm. Then you're required to stop at the way stations. But again, how do they know unless they pull you over? Because you're not going to say, you know, this is a commercial vehicle. It's when you get it wrapped, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> promoting a company, <laughs> then you're going to fall into the commercial aspect of it and you'll have to pull over. And it's kind of like this idea of the uh, fuel situation in Arizona because they charge a different price per gallon for commercial trucks for diesel versus private entities where you see RVers pulling over into the way stations are the transport companies pulling RVs from Indiana because they are a transport company and they're a commercial entity and then they are required to stop and go through the way station but right now we are not required for it for that and that's one thing escapees will fight for is because, you know, here's a shameless plug for SmartWay. Why do trucks have to stop at way stations? Well, the key word there is wait. It's because a lot of times they'll overweigh every, you know, they'll put too much product on there to get it to where they want to go. Where we, as, you know, as RVers, we need to uh, police ourselves so we don't have a legislature or legislate, legislate, uh, 
entity in the in a state like South Dakota, Texas, or wherever that will require us to do that. 57% of the, all, all of RVs going down the road statistically are overweight, either by gross combined weight rating, tire weight rating, axle weight rating, uh, vehicle weight rating. So this is why we, we encourage you to understand what your weight limits are. Don't go over that. As a peace officer, as an accident reconstructionist, if I thought weight was an issue in an accident, I would gather up all the pieces and I would drag it across the scale. Even if it was a private vehicle, even if it was an RV, and I've done RVs before out of accidents to see if they were actually overweight. We do the same thing for trucks also. So that takes me off that soapbox. <laughs> Sh right. Shameless plug for SmartWay. Yes, yeah, so let's just take a breath for a second. Um, but I'm about to put you on the spot again. So we're getting ready to wrap up. We're getting close to an hour, and I'm sure some of you guys want to get on with your afternoons. Um, but one of the things I do want to make a point to bring up is um, we have a program. Some of you may have already been part of it or heard of it. We have RVers Boot Camp, which is a program we do throughout the country several times a year. And he brought up the Boot Camp Express. Sometimes there are ones. Here, let me. I'm gonna steal this camera for a second <laughs> so I can actually talk to you guys. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so we have Boot Camp Express and our Beers Boot Camp, both of which are on hands-on on-site learning experiences where you get to talk to the instructors directly. You can um, you have your questions if you have any questions to going through the different sessions. And in some cases, I don't know that the Express offers this, but in the typical boot camp, you can even sign up for additional hands-on driving training with the company that we work with, RV Driving School. Oh, Express sorry. doesn't do that. Express I'm, does not do that. Yeah, okay, yeah, Express doesn't do that because there's because you only have one day and a lot to learn in one day. Um, however, think, there are things like that available. But one of the things I think is really awesome, and Jim has had a huge part in doing this, is especially for those of you who maybe don't have an RV yet or just your lifestyle doesn't permit you picking up and heading somewhere across the country for a couple of days, that sort of thing. Um, we do have RVers Online University, which is where a lot of this information about personal safety came from. Um, well, let me rephrase that. It didn't come from there. It is available there. <laughs> uh, and we also talked earlier about some fire safety concerns with RVs. And I know there is a lesson in that RVOU about fire safety as well. And it's a program that Jim's been working on quite a bit. And we've had a lot of RVers use it and it's, it, it originated from our RVers Bootcamp, although the RVers Online University program has grown to include more lifestyle type classes and courses as well. So there's actually more available in RVOU and it's a little bit less expensive because you don't have to worry about paying for facility costs and food and that sort of thing associated with Bootcamp. Um, but anyway, so that's something that if you're interested in, uh, in considering that, if maybe you want to learn a little bit more about personal safety, about fire safety, there, you guys even teach things about like your RV systems. Here, let me, let me give it back to him and he can tell you a little bit more about it. Hello. <laughs> so in, in, in the RV, uh, RV boot camp, we uh, cover fire, sa fire safety, personal safety, weight safety, tire safety, uh, RV systems, uh, some general maintenance stuff, some tips. We go in depth in battery, solar, uh, and such. RVOU does the same thing, and but we add more uh, depth to it also. Uh, we got staying connected on the road. We have uh, choosing your first RV or choosing an RV, some things that you need to, to realize what you need to do for that. Uh, another shameless plug, if, uh, as, as, uh, as she said, that we do have boot camps throughout the United States. Uh, the next one available that's still open will be February 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in North Ranch, Congress, Arizona. We'll do one February, March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Grand Prairie, Texas, south of Dallas. Then we go back to Tucson, Arizona for the Escapade Boot Camp. Then we'll do a boot camp in April in uh, Pine Mountain, Georgia, right before Skip Acre. And then we're actually going to take it to the northwest part of the country to uh, Oregon. We'll be up there in Oregon at uh, the Old Mill Casino. And I'm sorry, I have CRS, can't remember stuff. I can't remember the city it's in, but uh, uh, it's the Old Mill Casino, but it's, it's all on the website too. If you can't do that, take RVOU. Uh, but the, again, you know, don't feel like you're going to be by yourself out there. We've got a lot of good programs, but we'd love to have you. If not, send an email to Georgianne and she'll get with somebody to get you an answer. Oh yes, definitely. I'm going to steal this back for a moment. 
normally I've got two cameras set up because I'm in one place and, and our presenter is somewhere else, but Jim and I are hanging out in the office this week. We're both here for a few more days anyway. Um, but yes, yeah, so, and also do you find out about more about RVOU and our Beers Boot Camp and Smart Way and all the other things that Jim has had his hand in and the different programs that Escapees offers for RVers at escapees.com. It's pretty, pretty straightforward, just escapees.com. And in the menu section, most of these educational resources he's talked about will actually be under a menu conveniently titled education. So you can find out about all those different things, including more webinars like this, ones that we have scheduled to come up, which right now the schedule's clear. The end of the year gets kind of busy with planning and whatnot, so there's not a whole lot on the schedule just yet, but there are more coming. You can also view the full archive of past webinars uh, on there as well. We've been doing this for, it'll be, I think, two years in January, so there's not a whole lot on there. It's about 20 or so on there, but um, I'm always looking to add more as well. I'm typically the one that, that puts this together, organizes it, and hosts it. So if you have questions you'd like to have answered or you have some topic suggestions, you're welcome to send me an email. My uh, email address is marketing at escapees.com. Pretty straightforward. I'm the marketing director. So it's marketing at escapees.com. I'm always happy to hear from you. And um, I'm more than happy to do what I can to get your questions answered. Like you said, if you run into even just a question you have related to personal safety that maybe something came up after the fact, you're welcome to email me um, and I'll make sure that I get it to Jim if I can't answer it myself. Um, and also this will be available in case you're catching the end of it. Those of you watching on Facebook will have access to it pretty quickly. I believe it takes a few moments for it to finish uploading the full video, but it'll be available pretty quickly. And then we also take the recordings and edit them for some clarity and shorten them a little bit and put them up in that webinar archive. So that'll be there hopefully within the week, but it depends on how my schedule goes. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to edit. Um, but anywho, I appreciate you all joining us today. And of course, thank you so much, Jim, for joining and for offering your information. And, and by the way, I have to admit, I'm pr quite proud of Jim. We had a little friend join us in the office today. And this is the first time he's made his appearance, even though during our mini test runs, he has been quite, quite present. And I assure you, if this thing were real, I would not be handling it this step, this this easily. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to say, Jim? I'm gonna put no. you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, no. We we appreciate everybody coming in. It's a cockroach, in case you're wondering. Yes, a plastic one. Thing. A plastic one. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, no, if uh, as she says, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me at bootcamp at escapees.com, bootcamp at escapees.com, and uh, if I don't get back with you, it's because I'm out traveling, having fun. So just, but if you have questions, I'd be more than happy to answer it. Um, but again, bootcamp at escapees.com. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye.